first. Thank you for coming. Hmm? Yeah, thank you. For, oh, thank you. I mean, I tend to move a lot, so I will try to keep closer to the mic. Well, thank you for coming to this session. Um, this time, we are not going to talk about Drupal Console, so you are in the right session. <laughs> I think we're not even talking about Drupal this time. We could churn if you want. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, this is a uh, really fancy, fancy name with a, I mean, a lot of buzzwords. Creating a modern web application using Symfony, AI, Symfony API platform, React, Redux, and we missed something, right? Yeah, we have a bonus we didn't promote, so this is a surprise for people who, who sacrificed your lunch for here, so we are going to talk about a little bit GraphQL. How many people is excited about GraphQL? You should be. Perfect, perfect, you're my friends now. Okay, let me introduce us. So this is Jesus Manuel Olivas. He's our head of products in a company called We Know. Uh, you could contact him in Twitter and GitHub as GM Olivas and Drupal user. And this is his, his, his blog website. And Eduardo is joining me this time. Eduardo Garcia is our CTO from, uh, from, from We Know Company. Again, this is all of I mean, places where you can I mean, find Eduardo. Okay, so about what we give, as we say, we are the, uh, we know uh, us as persons, we are the maintainers of uh, Drupal console. So, thanks to the community right, uh, last week. Uh, okay, thank you to the community last week. Sorry? Yeah, closer. Okay. <coughs> so, as we mentioned, we are the company and what the to maintain the main maintainers to Drupal console. So thank you for the community. Last week we reached uh, this number, two million downloads since we started the project. Maybe the most interesting num uh, thing about this number is like uh, eight months ago, we reached our first million. So now we are in two million. So that's talk about the um, um, reception of this project for about the community. So if you are in the, uh, interested in more details about the things that, that are coming uh, about Drupal console, please feel free to try to contact us. Yeah, it took us like, like, a, like four years getting the first million, which is the hard one, the first yeah. one. Where we are? Uh, yeah, so we are a distributed company. We are fully remote. We, we are, as you see, we are basically in America, but we have a couple of resources in Europe, France, um, myself in Australia. Uh, this is basically what we do. We are 36 resources. And what we know about? Yeah, so uh, we know, as maybe you know, and you think we are a Drupal company, but actually we do more than that. This is why we are creating this, this session. So basically, uh, nowadays, every Drupal company is a 80% Drupal company, but actually is doing more than that because Drupal is a integrated system. So you can see the map with the CMS is 28 resources about that, but we also have uh, people working in React, uh, working in Angular, working in React Native, working in Angular, and also people is having different interests. In. So people is doing crazy stuff like uh, trying to connect Drupal or Symfony with uh, in, uh, artificial intelligence with Python and this kind of stuff. So this is this is the mesh that we are, have been talking about for the last two three years. It's like a create bridges, leaving the island. So now we are using these bridges these bridges to try to get connected everything, and this session is about that. Yeah, well, again, we're going to, topics I'm going to mention is API platform, the Symfony API platform, which is a framework to allow you to create out of the box and, and REST endpoints and GraphQL endpoints. So we're also gonna talk about GraphQL, and the t this is the tool we use for the API part. For the front end part, we use Re Re React, React.js, Redux, and Saga. And for the components part of the uh, UI, we use Ant design and components. And this is most like a, mm, like a recipe we, we have for building pro projects. Whenever we need to create a project that will be, mm, that requires to be an API, and there is not content centric, there is like not content management, there's no revision on, on the data. It's mostly like we need to, I mean, put data on it and then somehow, I mean, in, interact with that data from different places, like in, a, like in like <clears throat> from the mobile, from the ZLI, or from a web app. So this is what we tend to use instead of going to Drupal and, and use like, you know, like headless or decoupled Drupal. Yeah. This is kind of like decoupled Drupal on the Symfony way of doing things. And how we reach this solution or this recipe, as I mentioned about the bridges to leave the island. So actually we started using Drupal with React. 
then we, we noticed we could use React with Symfony. Then we noticed we could, yes, we could use React with Node.js. And then we noticed we could do Node.js with GraphQL. So we were really far away from Drupal, and now we, we decided to say, hey, we could do the circle. We can now use Drupal and Symfony with GraphQL. So that's many, even if you are not using Drupal, you are not at the factors, right? So you are trying to reach the technology and close the circle to try to integrate the solutions to provide the best solutions possible for your clients. Yeah, in talking about Symfony, the, this project is based on Symfony Flex. I don't know if you are aware of this. So there is latest version of Symfony, Symfony 4, but they also has a project they call Flex or Symfony Flex, which is basically a composer plugins that allow you to to automate some of the most common tasks, like so kind of like you know it make changes and improves the composer require composer update composer remove commands adding in when, whenever you enable a module copy some configurations to your project. And well, the, the main difference you will find out with Symfony Flex is how the directory structure is a little different. You will find out a config directory on your root project and the root of your project, and this is where all of the bundled configurations are located. Other than that, it's a pretty standard Symfony installation. Yeah, let's talk about the platform itself. So API platform. As I mentioned during the beginning, it is a REST a, in GraphQL framework, allows you to, to build a modern API I mean, projects. And a good benefit of using a tool, the same thing, the, the same reason what we use is Drupal. We use Drupal because there is a community, there is a, a lot of modules that we can take advantage of. Same thing with Symfony. By using the API platform project, we, take a, we can take advantage of all the modules to interact with, with, with the project. It means if we require to log in, there is a bundle for that. If, like user login, if we require authentication, there, I mean, or extending the authentication using a JWT tokens, there is a bundle for that. So that's the big benefit of, of using a project like, like Symfony Flex in this case. And the project, it's break into four pieces or four components. The API, which is the piece that we will be talking about, there is a schema, I mean, allows you to use default schema, I mean, compliant files. So you can use, I mean, automatically out of the box, use those and, you know, populate your, your database, doctrine database. It also includes an admin interface, React fully, I mean, I mean, functional, I mean, create, create, retrieve, and update and delete the interface. So you, without doing nothing, just by exposing the endpoints, you will be able to interact with this. It allows you like a form for adding and, and editing fields. And it also adds a, this a CRUD generator. It's a JavaScript scaffolding tool that allows you to create, I mean, React components. And uh, in order to use a API platform, it's, it's way too simple. I can say, pro you don't need, I mean, like 30 something clicks like Drupal, I mean, it's just Git clone and you are, you are, you are all set. The uh, minimum adjustments that we tend to do is change the, the route. So we point to API something. And since we are changing this configuration, then we change the data entry API endpoint for, for, the, for the client application. And once you git clone the project and make that change, the only thing you need to run is compose Docker Compose app. And well, you have to wait a few minutes or probably more than a few minutes because it used Docker and it's pull, I mean, I mean, it will start I mean, pulling images and all that. But you don't have to worry about like setting up nothing. I mean, out of the box, it's fully functional. And once you finish this process, you will have something like this in your, in your local computer. This shiny page that is telling you that it's installed and it's fully functional and it's working. Maybe what you, the first thing you want to do, it's adding more format. By default, it supports LD JSON and JSON format are pre-configured for you, but you can add more, way more formats. And those are, those are the available formats that you can, that you can use. And as in any Symfony configuration, when you have an array of values, the, fir the first one is the default value. So if you want to use LD JSON as default, just put it on the very top. If you want to use JSON, just move JSON at the very top of this list, and you are all set. And everything is configurable through YA, YML files. Well, maybe you are, since you are building an application, the, the, the next thing you're going to do is to start adding entities. In order to add a new entity, as in like, you know, something like an entity in Drupal or a content type if you want to, 
you need to in this case you need to create a class a PHP class so this is you know source entity directory is the place where you store your classes it's a plain PHP file the only thing you need to add is annotation you know this is an entity just allowing doctrine to discover this new entity and uh, that's it and I highly recommend you we highly recommend you to remove the default entity that's that is part of the project which is great so let's say for the purpose of this example we are going to add these three entities, post, post type, and user. I mean, we're not trying to build a CMS. It's just, I mean, we're using like similar concept that you are aware of, like, you know, like Drupal, you know, have posts and post types. So we're going to try, we're trying to use those concepts here. And remember Drupal hook update? Well, Symfony has something called Doctrine Migrations Bundle that allow you to, to uh, store on, your, on the file system all of your changes, all your database schema changes. So by running, let's say, if you add a new entity file, you know, post.php entity or post.type.php entity file. You just need to run migration, doctrine migrations diff, and this will create a new file for you. And this file will contain the schema changes. So later on, you, you just need to run migrations migrate, either you or the rest of your theme, or when you're deploying your site to production, to apply those changes. So it's basically like updating, allowing you to store in the file system and commit on your repo, allowing you to commit on your, on your repo, all the database schema changes, and you know, translate, I mean, move it easily between environments. Well, and uh, as I mentioned, one of the reasons of using Symfony is because there's a lot of bundles for adding an extra functionality. Since we're building an API tool, we require to have a login, user login inter I mean, interface, or using login functionality. So in this particular case, we are, I mean, we suggest you to use FOD user bundle if you don't want to like grow and um, grind all the integration yourself. And if you are using false user bundle, you need to be aware of this two blog posts. I mean, I'll, well, I'll share. I'll post the we'll post the slides on the, on the on the note page of the uh, session. The first one is the uh, official documentation of the bundle, and the second one is a bundle that is telling you that you should not use the bundle. And it's in the end, it's not it's not telling you you don't use it. It's telling you what, I mean the benefits, the pros and cons about using it. I mean, they claim there's a lot of field added to your. I mean, table that you might not need. So, good. I mean, a good, a good. I mean, having a better understanding of what you're doing when installing a module or a bundle for extending your, your project is a good idea. So, this is a really good read. I mean, you can have a better understanding of what you're doing. I mean, you're adding legacy code to your project, and then you can decide either to use it by knowing what is happening or use write one yourself. And another thing we tend to use a lot is creating commands. We like to automate things. You know. We think, or at least I think, whenever it's human involved in a process, there are chances or errors. So we like to automate things. In this case, we create, I mean, one single command to initialize the whole project in Symfony. Same thing we use in, in Drupal, Drupal console. So we create one command, which will take care of running the database migration and executing all those migrations and populating data on, their, on the entities. And for populating data with fake data on your project, you can use Ellis bundle and Basinga faker bundle. Let's move to something more interesting. Yeah, let's take a look how the, how the, I mean, the project looks like. Remember what I told you, use Docker Compose app and just create those three files for the entities. Once we have that, and if we do something like this, ta-da, so this is how the project looks like. So whenever you go in for the initial page of your, or your endpoint, which is in this case, well, API, API, you will see something like this. All of your entities are listed here. And you can start playing around with those. So it means if I go to post and want to try out, I can do try out here, and this will execute. What I will see here, they will show me the result, the result of all the data. Well, yeah, th this is really important because when we install those systems, we spend a lot of time to trying to figure out how to access and what is results we expect to have. So this is visually and quickly to try to have a better idea about what is going on and what specific data you already have, or and you could do com compare it with your database to try to to be sure that is the is is the same. And if you want to change the the format that you are interacting with the with the endpoint, you can just I mean change it here and just execute it again. And I mean, for any any new endpoint that you have. That you register or any entity you have, I mean, all those endpoints available. Something like API post. If you want to load the JSON format, you can go post.json. If you want to try the JSON only, then you can try post.json only. I mean, you can do this by the 
by the CLI or your application by changing the content type that you are I mean, calling. Now I'll show you how it looks like. And if you want to load one post, I mean, one single post, you can do something like API, then entity name, and then the ID. And for making calls from your CLI, remember what I told you about the reason for us, for us to building an API like, I mean, uh, project is because we, we know we, we want to interact for different clients. In this case, CLIs could be a client. So you, you will do a get, you know, you can use curl or, or wget, and then using get, and you call the endpoint URL, and you can specify the, <coughs> the content type that you are accepting or you are requiring to, for the endpoint to, to give you back. In this case, uh, you can use JSON or LD, LD JSON. And for adding posts from the CLI, it's the same thing. You can use, use post, the post method, and then you just pass the post, the URL, and you can start iterating here. As you can see here, we are passing the data we want to insert. So in this case, we're telling, you know, let's post in this URL using JSON format. I mean, uh, and I want to use JSON LD for passing the data, and we can specify fields or, you know, property and value that we are passing to the, to the, uh, <coughs> to the endpoint. And for, up, I mean, updating and removing posts, same thing, you can use, I mean, HTTP commands like put, delete, so any, I mean, everything is there, it's out of the box, you don't have to do nothing other than just make your entity, enable your entity. It is, it's a matter of adding an annotation in your entity, and that will be automatically discoverable by, by, the, by the framework for you. And w when you're using REST, I mean, as you can see here, when we are calling an endpoint, let's say like post, or a single post, like, in, uh, and you have entities, and you have nested entities, you know, like in Drupal, we have relations, we have a, we have a field who is pointing to another entity or content type, which is related by an ID. In the case of, of REST, most of the time what it happens is you need to do like two calls. The first one for getting the main entity, and another call, another REST call for getting the, the relation. In order to fix this, this problem, the uh, API platform allows you to use the serializer component of Symfony, and by using annotation, and something they call normalization context, context and denormalization context. You can create your own groups and say, you know, when I'm reading, when I'm using the endpoint for reading data, I want to enable this relation. And instead of showing me the ID, please go and you know pull the, the data related to this entity. You know, it's like a relation, but it tells you, so it brings you back, not the ID, it brings you back the data from the related entity. The downside of this is you need to add, I mean, I mean, a single annotation to every single field that is an entity, I mean, it's an entity relation, or one to, one to many relation, which is kinda, I kinda, I mean, could be like kinda cumbersome, so we decide to instead do something else, which is GraphQL. Exactly, so it's not like the other solution is not working, so it's totally usable, but we were thinking about to explore another option to try to do things easier as possible. So GraphQL, if you're not familiar with that, you could think about like a middleman or is an abstraction layer between your client or your backend. In this case, it's Symfony. So that's mean the solution we're going to explain here. You could take which part you want. If you like the server side, keep with that. Or if you like the client side, keep with that. And you could use GraphQL and then in, uh, in the backend could be anything because GraphQL is an, is, a, is an abstraction to allow the client to decide exactly to take whatever they want from the server, right? Instead of to try to be um, uh, aware about how many fields are going to receive, if it's going to work or not. So this is especially good for GraphQL. Yeah, I mean, when, it's, when you use REST and you call an endpoint, the endpoint returns you all of the fields on that on the model. And maybe you don't want to. I mean, you don't require all those fields. You maybe just want like one title or a body or something. With GraphQL, you can just select exactly the data you want to fetch. So the idea is of GraphQL, uh, the foundations are in two concepts. First is types. Mm -hmm. So you, you just need, types is something like a unit to define. Uh, so maybe in the other side in the server is a Fortran system, it's a database, it's a text file. So you, you just define what are you going to return to the server, to the, to the client from the server. And the other thing is the resolvers, which is how as a function to uh, help you to combine all the sources to try to return the specific uh, type you want to return to the client. The good thing is using this package, uh, the, the WebOnyx GraphQL PHP, integrated with API platform, all this matter is resolved for you. So I, I using this the um, doctrine schema, 
So you don't need to be worried about that because in other GraphQL implementations, obviously you have to write by yourself because we are using a Symfony solution. You just you take the solution you already have, you install this, and then GraphQL is ready to use. And easy as simple. It's, it, so the whole process we have covered until the, uh, until now could be take outside the Docker part, <laughs> <laughs> uh, could be five minutes or less. In the composer part. Uh, well. Yeah, and part. so the same way REST endpoints are automatically discovered by the platform <coughs> for you, same thing for the for the GraphQL endpoint. So you don't have to do nothing other than adding an annotation, which is like, you know, and for again, for the endpoint, and that will be, for the entity, sorry, and that will be automatically discovered by the system. Yeah, so after install the package, as we, the same way we did with the app platform, you need to define what you, um, if you want to expose, because this is, Graf GraphQL, what we're, I am going to show in a minute, in theory, is only for development because this is a helper for you to try to build the queries you are going to execute with the client into the server. So when you are going to production, please disable. Yeah, make sure you disable, Un unless you want to expose your endpoint to the world. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, so the idea, this is a typical query when you, that you could do with GraphQL. So you have you need to provide what resource you want to do. So in this case, with because it's Symfony, so in theory GraphQL, no in theory, no, it's real. So <laughs> with a regular REST, you have many entry points, and you could attach and then a sequentially request. But in GraphQL, you only have one, and then you need to decide what resource you are going to get. In this case, this is a call for a specific post, and we are getting three fields, right? So you could think about this like a, maybe you are doing a mobile application and this is the field release. This is something for iPhone, all version, and then you get this, those three, three fields and everything is working. But later, uh, you can have more fields. Okay, but later maybe you do a next iteration in your application, maybe you more rich content. And then remember what we do with serialization, like I use the reference with, with entities so in the resolver part, which is, is already did for you because for the component, you could decide to try to get more rich information. So imagine you have two clients, two different versions of the mobile application. The one client, they have the last one, but the other guy, for any reason, he, he already have the, the old one. The idea with GraphQL is that both will be functional because the client is deciding what he really wants. So this is the second version, and then you decided to provide information about the machine name of a related entity, and now we are getting more information from 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 our server if you if we want. And the, and if you see the the ID in this case is the the resource you want you want to try is the same. It's just I, I, like the way I like to think about GraphQL is like a the client is the boss, right? So the 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 backend is just is just to provide whatever you need. So as you can see here, we have two, two different calls to, to the to GraphQL endpoint. We are fetching some fields in here, and in the other one, we are fetching different fields. As, an, as Andrew mentioned, and you can even take like, re, you can fetch related data, any field that you want. You can remove fields from here. So you are not fetching the whole data that, you, that your rest, rest, as REST is, is doing it for you. And well, if you want to use the CLI for doing this or in your project, you can make sure you also pen, you can specify the content type, I mean, which is the type that you want to retur get returned. Like in this case, I'm asking for the GraphQL endpoint to return data in using JSON format, and I'm passing a query. So this query that you can see here is the same one we have on the on the graph graph GraphQL part. Okay. Okay. Remember what I told you about user. So we enable the false user bond, right? Which is allows me to interact with the system by providing a user and password. It also takes care of creating the database, the required tables, and all that for me. Might be, I mean, but in this case, we're building a decouple application. It means we have an API in one part and we have the client in a, in a different part. And in this particular case, we are using JavaScript for using the client, which is a totally different technology. For this particular case, we use JWT, will allow you to log in a user by providing a user and password and return you back a payload of data and that data include a token which is like an ID and you can use this this, this or that ID for the 
I mean, uh, following interactions with your client. It means you set your user and password, read the value that returns for you, and that value has a time, I mean, time to leave, like say, like an hour or 30 minutes. It depends, it's up to you how do you configure. But basically, you keep using that ID instead of keep passing your user and password for the upcoming request. And in order to do this, we use uh, those bundles, so again, same as Drupal, there is, a, there is a module for that. When using Symfony, there is a bundle for that. We're using those bundles for, the first one is for providing the authentication, what allows me to expose an endpoint that I can call and will return me data. And the other one is the refresh token bundle. So we introduce this bundle to avoid forcing the user to re-enter his user and password credentials when, whenever the, the, the token expires. So this bundle allows you to send the old expire token to the application and return you back a new valid token. When using JW2, I mean, you might be want to change the payload data that it returns to you, so you can create a new service. I mean, same as in Drupal, fortunately, because Drupal is in Symfony components, a way to register uh, services, creating a class, and then registering a um, definition on a YML file. So what we use, tend to do is creating a service, uh, tagging as a listener, and we, on the onCreate method that, that we implemented, we can change the data that, by default, the JW, JW2 project is returning. So you can add, let's say you want to add the organization ID of the, of the user, you want to add the role ID of the user, and this will return you that data the first time you call, when, when the uh, JW token is created on, on the system. And sometimes what it happens is you can probably create specific data for your token, but you don't want to fetch all of that, all that data, you can, you can change the, the payload that it returns for you when asking you know, the token data it's, or, or the uh, values that contains that token for you. So you can use the same thing. You, create an, you register an event, you tag as a service, and you change the payload that is returned for you. But maybe my, we talk about uh, the server side, and now let's talk about the, the client side. So we want to talk about some combination with, between React, Redux, Redux Saga, and, and Undesign. Maybe the less popular here is Undesign. We will talk about a little later. When you're here, it's in video <laughs> games. You know, like, are you aware of Overwatch? Yes, no? No, okay. So this is a, a framework created for Alibaba the Chinese e-commerce um, company. So they are investing a lot of in technology, uh, in, in open source. So uh, how we ended up here? We ended up here because we are starting using Undesign. Uh, and then we found that like, uh, we want to have all these products with React, with GraphQL, with everything, and they create a micro framework to try to uh, wrap all technologies in order to create a rapid development using all these solutions. So check it out later the, the URL. So the good thing is when we started this, was everything was in Chinese. So and then we learned Chinese. <laughs> yeah. And now it's in English. So Now yeah. we are learning English. Uh, actually, I found it because I, I uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, I mean, the last year, I mean, Year ago, year and a half ago, every single issue was Chinese. Actually, there is a there is a post on on Medium. You know, this is a great project, but it's you know, all of the issues are Chinese and documentation, and they really took it on the in the good way, and they improved a lot. So now the issues are Chinese and English. Documentation is English. You need to think, uh, like uh, two years ago when I just started, everything was in Chinese, but it was so good that I say, okay, Chinese is not a problem. I could use the translator to do that, but works. Like a chunk. Yeah, seeing enough people is using oh, it's, it. It's, it's pretty awesome. So, as as I say, with the travel is like a in this side. So we well, it's circular. We started with React, which is famous for everybody. And at the beginning, we were try to I what I would try to find a set of components to allow me to go to create a complete solution. It's like uh, Drupal for CMS because there are too many you know dispersed uh, components. Uh, maybe we reduce our uh, development time in terms we don't need to redo the code, but you need to spend a, lo a lot of front end to try to make all, s all of these components look similar, like <laughs> it's your complete application. So you are losing and gaining. And also you need to learn any specific API for this specific component. So the inputs were different than the slider, the calendar was different and blah, blah, blah. So what this guy did with uh, Undesign is they have components for 
almost all the things you could imagine. They have a consistent API, a consistent user interface, and it's easy to try to replace uh, the look and feel using less. A consistent naming convention for parameters also, and properties, yeah. which is just great. It's, 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 it's just awesome. So we started using React, we started with Unit and Design, we say, okay, we could use Redux, which is to React itself have a simple state system, but if you want to create a complex application, you need you, Redux is the best to try to have a, a complete state system across the application. And Redux Saga is the evolution to try to easy accent and managing your state um, to facilitate your development Yeah, by when you're calling endpoints from your, from your mm -hmm. like grading actions, in, <coughs> then you end up adding reducers for, I mean, and creating namespaces for your for your state because in the end the state is just an array JavaScript array that you interact with. So uh, we we find out like using Redux Saga help us to do the API calls and then I mean ma doing calls to update the state. So basically it's I mean the whole I mean recipe here it's, it's pretty, pretty I mean pretty straightforward to use. I'll show some code. Don't worry about it. if you don't understand what you see because it's kind of looks pretty daunting at the mm -hmm. beginning, but once you once you find out, I mean, start getting like use is it's pretty, it's pretty, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. It's like Drupal when you start, <laughs> it's like, wow, what is this thing? It's monster. It works, it works great. Yeah, so the, the DBA project, uh, the Overwatch stuff, so they provide a solution. So uh, as, all, as usual, the, it is not a perfect solution. So they use something Roadhoe to try to automate stuff. Which is another <laughs> Overwatch another character. They have. But we found that it was difficult to try to create like a global uh, configuration or something. So we disabled that and we use Webpack, which is pretty famous, uh, pretty famous for that. Uh, so we use uh, Apollo Fetch, which is created by the creators of Meteor.js in order to get the connections uh, from the GraphQL, in this case, the Symfony server. Uh, as to say, we use JWT, the code, in order to do the login to the, in the application. We use local storage for simple uh, uh, storage of obviously of variable and, if, and for more complex objects and interaction in our application, we use IndexedDB. Uh, also, the, uh, there are other solutions, but we yeah, found there's there, yeah, IndexedDB. It's pretty much like this, like the definition or the standard, mm -hmm. and there is like you know same as in Drupal, like <laughs> hundreds of hundreds of packages on npm that you can use. I mean, just pick your weapon, weapon of choice, and it basically allows us to to store or in, I mean, for encrypting data on the, on the client and also for more complex structure. And the last part is the last, is a, something yeah. that I like a lot. Mm -hmm. So at some point, unfortunately, the Symfony GraphQL implementation or the PH, uh, Symfony platform GraphQL implementation, it doesn't support subscriptions for GraphQL queries. So we end up uh, adding to the recipe uh, Redis. So we use Redis on the PHP side for queuing messages using a meter, so emitting messages on Redis, and then we use WebSocket on the client side to pulling all those, reading all those messages on, on the client application. Because, I mean, again, unfortunately, it's not supported yet. Uh, there is an issue for that. We'll, we'll probably jump into the issue and try to help if we can, mm -hmm. and if you, if you can as well. Yeah. So the sure. theory about all this solution, because every single point of view uh, is like a, it's a nightmare for a lot of people because there is, no, there is not a cohesion we could find in Drupal or, or Symfony. So only the socket EO is like, a, oh, I need to start a spread server. You need to do many crazy things and everything looks like a isolated and not a stable and impossible to scale. But using these solutions with the DBA and all this, everything is, it, is getting better and better. So we take a lot of these techniques socket EO and Redis and everything in another implementation we have with Meteor.js and using React. So as I say at the beginning, the idea is, is like a you could jump uh, technologies and you could reuse the logic you use to solve in other projects. So before to use GraphQL, we use DDP from Meteor and words for front solution to connect with .NET, with Java, but in PHP, no. So we, <laughs> we have to Because you need a client. Yeah, we don't, and then that's what we find out about GraphQL. So we were like, how we expose an endpoint from this MongoDB and Meteor application? You know, guess what? You cannot create an endpoint. And then why don't we use, I mean, an REST endpoints? So we find out about GraphQL, we start playing with it, and we love it, so we start using it as well. Mm -hmm. And how the application looks like, it's kind of like this. You have a 
directory structure, SRC, where all your code is located. The most important files here is the index.js file, which is the main entry point of your application. It's like your form controller, your, like your index.php file. And we also have, we also used to a constant JS yeah, file. This is this is where we replace Red Hot, Red Hot for uh, Webpack in order to be able to define these variables to be used by the client application. Yeah, because we we have configurations on the application to behave that mm, de be behave on different on development and production and our stages. So we use do a heavy usage of I mean EM, I mean EMB variables. Well, we also have the index.js file, which contains your, I mean, your application definition. We create a new object here, like app equals to db object. You can pass, you can, I mean, initialize your state values here, and you know, then we register the global models. In this case, we have out, which is, takes, is the model who takes care of the authentication for logging and refreshing token. The local model, which is basically any any data list that we are showing on the on the application that is not controlled by the user, if not provided by the application itself. Let's say there's a list of something which is default by the application. We provide, we store on the, we use the local storage mechanism for, for doing that, for avoiding, you know, too many fetches to the endpoints. And we... Hmm? Okay, so maybe you could think this is a structure. So obviously this is pretty, is far away from a simple JavaScript file to load your application. So you remember when you create Node.js <coughs> application, you is more than a single jQuery file. So you are creating a pretty complex solution for the client. And uh, when I saw bigger projects, it's, it looked like a very professional, like a symphony, a big application. Because uh, from the client side, you have to resolve many complex things that in our side, in Symfony and PHP, it's easy to solve, right? Yeah, and well, another important file is the router file. So uh, the, the, w the way we manage, we create object for routes, so we don't, and we register those routes dynamically. We separate the object, the login object, and I'll, I'll, in the next slide I'll show you why. So we have a login object and then the route, route ob object. And as we can see, this array, what it, this array takes care of, it's for like dynamically loading, you know, the different application components. Let's say this is my the component for the entity. So we dynamically load it here, and then we have this iteration where we are using you know, route map function for iterating the values and then rendering, rendering my component for, for the routes. As you can see here, we separate those because we have the login route outside of this out route. So this is a custom component that we wrote. I'll show you how it looks like. This component, it uses or extend the, the route, the default route component, it also I mean, allows you to asynchronously call a promise a function, which is basically the one who takes care of review. Is your token valid? Then, then the route gets loaded, and if it's not, as you can see here, I mean, redirect you back to the login. So it, this is only calling a promise, a unit promise. This, then something, right? So if this is true, then let you go. If it's not, then let you redirect to the login. Well, we have the component looks like this. This is how we interact with the state. We have a function. We define uh, this, the, the namespace for the uh, entity we want to interact with. In this case, pose. We define the default. I mean, the default initial state here, and then we have the reducer section here. By using Redux and Saga, this is how you interact with your state. We have this class with the reducers function here, and we this is how we interact with the state. And I mean, make sure when you are interacting with the state in React, you don't change the state itself. You create a new state every single time. It allows you to like move back in time and see the whole, how your whole application is behaving and changing while using it. And then this is how, this is a, a section on your class definition, it's called effects. So this is the place that you will be, or the, the function that you will be calling in your system. So your system will be calling something like pose.fetch function. And this is the place where you have the, the proper code to calling your endpoint. As you can see here, we have a GraphQL, GraphQL query. So we're calling pose, we're telling, you know, GraphQL, return me back the first 10 values, and I want to see those, you know, ID, IDE, title, and body, and the type. Remember the GraphQL query we show you for? So it's the same thing here. And finally, once you return this data, you, you create this object list for returning the value. Mm. Yeah, you end up using the put function to 
to, to I mean, up, um, to update your state or to create a new state in your application. So you basically go here, post equals to calling the fetch function, right? Remember the fetch function that we created before? And you call it here, your, I mean, you return this and return this as a list. So we create this map functionality to extract some data and manipulate some data from the GraphQL endpoint to create an, I mean, like plain array for us and then store on the, on the, on the, on the state. And then your components will be look something like this. You will have a different directories within the components directory, you know, different, I mean, directories for a specific group of components. And for one entity, we tend to use something like project base, which contains that, you know, all the, the logic that could be like functional, you know, like controller base in, in Drupal, and then edit, list, and new. I think we can show some example. Yeah, so the idea is we are going to, cho to show you an uh, internal application we are working on. So this is... Uh, so this is how the graph queue uh, work, yes, looks like. For, yeah, the idea is, is like a, you could use the download, the documentation explorer in order to inspect what items you have available to search. You could use the search area in order to try to build the query. So. This is connected with the specification. If you are w try to write in something that is invalid, immediately you will get the error. And it's out of complete built on. <laughs> yeah. So actually, this is the idea how they call graph, right? For me, at the beginning, it was a little com complete. Weird, this graph curl. Why graph curl? <laughs> and it's because it's everything graphical. So this is a symphony application using all the techniques uh, we mentioned. Let's this is how it looks and design uh, out of the box. Let's uh, let's see if the internet allows to to log in, because internet, yeah, it's logging. So what Jesus is going to do is he's going to create. Uh, well, this is a system who is connected with Bitbucket, DigitalOcean, and, and others. So we are enable the integration did with this website with GitHub. Uh, maybe you explain that. Yeah, it, it's a, it's a system that allow you to deploy your application. So we basically the recipe we talk about is the the what the one we use for building this this tool. Internet is so, it's so slow. So it allows you to connect your project with GitHub, Bitbucket, or you know GitLab or your own, and then from there you can start. Once you connect with Git, GitHub in this case, it automatically, I mean, add a web, I mean, webhook, I mean, URL, and it also add the. Uh, so what happened is, is now is we are trying to get a handshake with GitHub to try to enable the webhooks. It's taking too long. But yeah, automatically, you know, add this SSH key for you so you can start using the project for deploying, you know, your site. So basically allows you to create like temporary stages of your of your project. I mean, dynamically create servers for you and, and all that. Dynamically, so you don't have to worry about this is like a CI and QA tool. And also allow you to build your artifact and deploy to your production server. In this case, it could be Akia, Pantheon, or your own services, servers if you want to. Okay. Well, internet is terrible. Let's let's wave this. Let's wait one more second or two. Mm -hmm. We have five minutes. So the, the idea is obviously when after we do the connection, we use socket EO to try to improve the user interface with the user. You know, try to do the interaction, enable the user to request some tasks, do everything in background, continue doing something else, and when the process was finished, then you get a notification using the UX, the UI, and we. We use GraphQL and notification and socket to try to create a, a, a smooth application. Nah, never finish. Well, yeah, how the how the com this is the components that we mentioned and design. So it provides you with this sidebar, the layout component. It allows you to, I mean, I like to form. Let's say I can start just typing things here and you know, like making things and. All these forms and fields and any, anything here is is uh, is based on on those components. What we tend to use is create our own components on top of those components to interact with them. And as you can see here, yeah, and the the value was created, the form was rendered again, and um, this is how it looks like. I mean, let's say we can probably go back to activity, and this is how a table looks like. In, when when it's filled with data, you can see here. But I mean, you didn't have to do. Nothing other than take advantage of those, same as Drupal, you know, like Drupal form, yeah, then they have forms, they have, I mean, the sliders, they have like tabs. So the idea is to try to use the tool to, to invest your development time in the important Notifications things. here. In the business logic. You ah, okay, you see the notification there? That means the application get the connection with the GitHub and then we create a SSH that will be all loaded into GitHub 
to allow it to create the integration with the code itself. So yeah, basically what happens, the app do something, you know, call the GraphQL endpoint, the endpoint do something, call the server. Everything here is asynchronous, nothing happens. I mean, we have like message broker. So the message brokers go to the back, do what it has to do, and then put the message on the, on the Redis emitter. And as you can see, we use the WebSocket to refresh the interface and send those messages here. As you can see, the notification <coughs> was also pushed via WebSocket. So again, this is um, the recipe we, we use for this. It also notify you on a Slack, I mean, whatever you want to. <clears throat> that's it, go. Uh, yeah, and that's it for all. So if you have any question before to go launch, uh, go ahead, this is the mic. Uh, could you go to here? Because we wanted to, okay, the question is why don't we use, why we don't use Drupal? I mean, we love Drupal, we use Drupal in whenever, whenever it's a right solution. The thing here, this is not a content centric, there's no like node revision, there is, we don't, we don't really need bootstrap Drupal for this. We can, this is li light, I mean, uh, Symfony API platform is lighter for bootstrap. Sorry? The additions, you mean the, Oh, well, yeah, I mean, but in the end, it's like, this is not a content centric, it's more, more like put, in, putting data and fetching data, so we don't really need the full Drupal. We don't need like build content types there, we don't need widgets, we don't need formatters. So it's like, for this case, we didn't need Drupal. So whenever, when, whenever we are building an application and there is no, no, not content centric, we, we take the solution instead. Instead of going Drupal and you know, then they turn on J JSON API and GraphQL and build something on top, because I mean, in the end, you can use the same front end sol re mean solution, or recipe, and use in any, anything you want, so like Drupal or you know, Django REST or Go or build your own in JavaScript if you want to. Any other question? Oh, I, I, I can probably, yeah. I mean, I can add I mean, a few slides with the code. I mean, that won't be a problem. I can add this I mean, on the slide and when I upload it, it will be updated. Yeah. This, this you, you can do that by using role, the group roles, and then you use the, so whenever you're logging with JWT, that you're, you, ha, you have access to the user on the PHP side of things. So based on the role or, I mean, on the, that user belongs to, you can define, to, you can change doctrine queries on the fly and select what you want to see or what, what not to see. And creating those groups is how you define. Yeah, you declare an using an annotation on the entity. Any other question? Okay, thank well, you so thank much. De hecho, en el, en el ejemplo de, de cuando cambié el, el, el payload del JWT, agregamos el organization ID o el role ID. El role ID lo, lo agregamos regularmente en el login. Exacto. Lo fecheas y lo tienes. Entonces, con el JW decode. Sorry, in Spanish. When you use JW decode, you can I mean, decode the JW token and from there you can access the role and decide. Okay. But I mean, dealing with that on the client is a little dangerous. I mean, I really like to free fetch user data to what, what I want. But avoid it to them to see the value itself. Yeah. But you can, I mean, you definitely you can do that. I, some people say the storing data on the, on the client is dangerous as well, so this is, then just figure it out. Like, <laughs> yeah, but remember, when, whenever you call the API on the back end, uh, you, can, you can there is a um, doctrine, you can use doctrine to change the queries and all that.
part of the data and just pull from them for example. Then you have yeah, some variables. Yeah. Like on Laravel in particular, you work with this. So if you only have like different meaningful endpoints, yeah. yeah. then you can create this graph. Yeah. yeah. So like new <laughs> to perfection <laughs> check from other people to check to like arranging one in one yeah. table. Yeah. Just like one 